Air Combat Command provides conventional and information warfare forces to all unified commands. You'll have his uh, bio in your program. Very pleased to have him with us again this year. I'll now turn the podium over to General Hawk Carlisle. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, if you'd go ahead and run the video and keeping up with the Robinsons, I have to have a video as well. So. Well, thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here this morning. It's truly an honor to be here. I show that video because I think it provides great context. It shows our origins uh, from the Army Air Corps days to where we are today as the greatest Air Force on the planet. Uh, the other thing it does, it gives us a chance to recognize that those that have gone before us. We stand on the shoulders of giants, as has been said earlier uh, this week, and it's those folks that put us here to make us here force that we are today. So before I get started with that, that goes to our past and uh, present. I'm really wanting to talk today about the future and where we're headed. Uh, before I get into that, I would like to welcome everybody here. Uh, General Grass, it's great to have you here, sir. Thanks for being part of it. Secretary Wynn, it's good to see you again, sir. Thanks for being here. Uh, General Robinson, Dave Rob, thanks for being part of this. I appreciate it. And for everyone here, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you for a little while this morning. Um, hopefully, I'll get through these slides. It's only about 180 or so. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and, uh, and then maybe take some questions at the end. So the title is Fifth Generation, and the reason I started with that title was it, it's not necessarily an airframe or anything. It's really about technology and thought and where we're headed. It's how we move our Air Force to continue to be the best Air Force on the planet and what it takes to get there. So that's really what I am going to talk about today as I go through this. And you certainly start with this uh, incredible platform and what it does for our Air Force today. Um, the uh, first F-35s have rolled out at Hill Air Force Base in Utah, as you're well aware of. If you look at what the F-22, the picture just had up on the slide, and what it's doing against the fight in ISIS, it is absolutely incredible. And I'd venture to say it does more than it was even thought it could do. It produces greater capability, and when put it in the hands of our airmen, it does fantastic things. It's an aerial quarterback. The situational awareness that the F-22 provides to that guy inside that cockpit, or that girl in that cockpit, and then what they're able to do with that to make every single air plane in the airspace on the coalition side that much better is simply amazing in what that airplane does. It's stealth, super cruise, maneuverability, and then that sensor suite and the situational awareness it provides that pilot. Same thing with the F-35. It is the most powerful, comprehensive, integrated sensor suite we have ever developed. You combine that with incredible electronic warfare capability in both electronic countermeasures and electronic counter countermeasures, you put it on a multi- uh, a discipline airplane that can do multi roles, and you remove the need for service or for mission specific airplanes, and you really have an airplane along with the F 22 that, again, in the hands of our airmen, will change the way we do warfare. And it really is about getting to that next generation and where we go from here. And I think most importantly, though, is it's not just about platforms. 
These airplanes don't operate in a bubble. It takes our incredible airmen and the way they use these airplanes, and they use all the equipment, whether it's RPAs, DCGS, our satellite systems, the new fifth generation airplanes, what's going to come next in sixth generation airplanes, but it's the way we think. We are a service that was born out of technology. Airmen, by nature, are innovators. It's the way we think. We think different than other people and it allows us to take advantage of capability at a level that nobody else can do. We need capital I innovation from industry, from small business, from our labs, from our academy, from AU, from all those folks that are out there thinking about technology and where we go and how we get to that next level. We need the best technology on the planet, and I know that the United States is a place that that will be produced. We also need big I innovation from big A airmen and how they take that technology and capitalize that and make that the best it can possibly be and turn our Air Force continue our Air Force to be the best Air Forces on the planet for decades to come. And it's really all about our airmen and how we get there. Okay, so uh, if you'll indulge, indulge me for just a few minutes, I'm, uh, I love history and I'm a firm believer in um, those that don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. So I'm going to go through a couple of vignettes that get us to where the thought that I'm thinking about today. It starts with the advent of air power in 1783. The Montgolfier brothers developed a hot air balloon and they flew it in 1783. There were journalists there at the time and almost instantly they started talking about how you would use hot air balloons in reconnaissance for military operations. And then in 1794, General Jean-Baptiste Jordan, in the Battle of Fleurot, used the balloon to help his uh, French forces overcome the Austrian forces. They had two folks in a balloon for over nine hours, and it really did help secure the victory. And then along came Napoleon. Napoleon wasn't dazzled by this whole new technology. He didn't like it, so he shut down the French balloon school, and he said, I'll rely on the cavalry to do my reconnaissance. Can you imagine any modern-day commander turning down the opportunity for overhead surveillance? That would never happen. It's just not, it's not thought of. But M Napoleon did that because he was short-sighted and he didn't understand what technology was going to do for him. And in fact, the balloon did not re-emerge until our very own Civil War almost 60, almost 60 years later. And of course, tank doctrine is, again, it's a great, uh, not necessarily air power, but it is illustrative of lessons learned. So both the French and the Germans suffered horrific uh, casualty rates from trench warfare in World War I. At the end of that war, they both had access to the tank in, in small numbers at the very end of the war. They both had access to the same technology, but what they did with that technology was totally different. The French looked at it and said, yeah, we don't really think there's any place for the tank. We're going to work on bigger and better fortifications. They were thinking World War I thoughts and they were going to build the Maginot Line and the bigger and better fortifications. The Germans, on the other hand, said, hey, you know what? If we armor this thing up, we can potentially take this and m get movement back onto a stagnant battlefield. And, of course, the results are Blitzkrieg and what happened to the French at the beginning stages of World War II. I think the other part of this is that we have to be cognizant of is, is you know, obviously we love technology and we're all about technology, but the technologically, technologically superior force does not always win the war. This is a case of the, the famed Russian night witches. They were an all-female bomber squadron in Russia in World War II. They flew biplanes that were made out of cloth and wood, and they flew them against ME-109s and Focke-Whiff 190s. And before the end of the war, the night witches dropped over 23,000 tons on German positions and devastating effects on the German lines. But they did it with ingenuity and tactics, techniques, and procedure. They'd fly at night, only at night. They wouldn't fly in the daytime. And on their bombing runs, they'd shut off their engines so they could coast in unheard. And incredibly successful. Another part of it is innovation and time. Uh, obviously, that's Colonel John Boyd. Then Captain John Boyd flew F-86s in Korea. And the F-86s obviously had an astounding success rate against what was a superior airplane, the MiG-15. And John Boyd was trying to figure out how come the Americans had this great kill ratio against an airplane that should have been better. And he attributed it to decisions and our ability to react faster than the other guy. And that's where we got his OODALU, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act, is where that came from, is in Korea. And today, the F-15 and F-16 are largely a result of the thoughts that John Boyd had as a result of the Korean War. And the airplanes and the success we've had today with those two incredible airplanes largely to do with John Boyd. So, history lesson's over. We'll get college credit later. Um, 
what we do in the CAF, the Combat Air Forces, is we're responsible for uh, five core functions in the Air Force, and along with uh, my good friend Lori Robbins, General Lori Robinson, General Frank Gorick, General Robin Rand, and General Brad Heithold, we are, quote unquote, the Combat Air Forces, and we're responsible for these five core functions. So what I'd like to do is talk about these a few minutes, I'll highlight some incredible airmen, but I'd also like to talk about what we're thinking about and where we're headed in these five core functions. So air superiority, global precision attack, uh, global Integrated Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance, Command and Control, and Personnel Recovery. So, okay, history's not quite over. So, um, we have not lost anybody to an aerial attack from an enemy since April 15, 1953. These are the last two folks we lost. PFC Herbert Tucker and Corporal William Walsh. Sixty-plus years of air superiority pretty incredible when you think about it. And we've had that because our Air Force is that good. But like our Vice Chief says, General Dave Goldfein, he talks about it, everybody has come to expect that, like turning on a light switch. And it's not just air superiority, it's across everything we do. It's space, it's mobility, it's strike, it's ISR, it's command and control. Everybody believes that you just turn on the switch and the Air Force makes it happen. But that's not the case. We have to work at it. And our adversaries, we'll talk about in a second, they're getting better and they're going to try to stop us. It's like saying that I know I'm going to pass the PT test even if I don't go to the gym and work out because I've always passed the PT test. Well, that's not the case. That's hubris. We have to work to maintain the advantage that we have across our Air Force capabilities and certainly in air superiority. Because the foundation of the joint fight is you've got to have air superiority. If you don't understand the high ground, if you don't have that, you're not going to win that fight. You're going to put too many people in peril, you're going to lose too many lives, you're going to lose too much equipment, you're going to lose too much supplies. So you have to have that capability. And our adversaries, as you've heard the Chief and Secretary James talk about, they are getting better. They're getting better at a phenomenal rate. That's the Russian PAC-FA, uh, the Chinese uh, J-20. They're doing RPAs. They're in the cyber realm like we'll talk about, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But they are getting better at a rapid pace. Our technological advantage is shrinking. I got the good fortune to travel with General Welsh to uh, China a little while ago, and we were talking to the chief of the PLA Air Force, General Ma. And he looked at General Welsh and he said, we watch the Americans and the coalition in Desert Storm, in Air War over Serbia, in Enduring Freedom, in Iraqi Freedom, and we, the PLA Air Force, said we have to change. If we don't change, we can't keep pace with them. And they are changing, as are the Russians and as is everyone else. Our adversaries are getting better and we can't stand still. We can't rest on laurels. We can't say Technologi technology will win the whole war. We've got to do it all. And it's going to take the way we think in the future to continue to be the best Air Force this world's ever seen. So we'll start with a couple of things. One is uh, some of our deployment concepts and how we get there. Now, there's some great examples. What the B-1 and B-2 did uh, during Operation Odyssey, Don, in Libya was absolutely phenomenal. What the B-2 did in uh, full eagle in Korea uh, right after the North Koreans set off the nuke test was, again, 38 and a half hour mission, just an incredible capability. Well, we're taking that to every platform and everything we do. That picture right there is a picture of an F-22 having just taken off from Amari Air Base in Estonia. That picture was taken about 10 days ago. But our ability to get places rapidly with our incredible mobility air forces, the C-17 is just a phenomenal platform in what it does. KC-46 is only going to add to that capability. The concept of Rapid Raptor was developed in the third wing in PACAF because you had F-22s F and C-17s in the same wing. And they came together and came up with a great concept. It's incredible. What does Rapid Next look like? We're also developing a rapid uh, personnel recovery roll-on, roll-off capability. We're going to exercise that here in a couple months in an overseas location. But think about it. When United States air power shows up in places and at times people don't expect, that's an incredible capability. It assures our allies and it sends a message to adversaries of what we can do. And we're developing this and it's getting better all the time. And I also believe that when we get this right, we will truly be able to give more capability to the combatant commanders with the amount of capacity we have. And it's developing at a rapid pace again, uh, incredibly successful. That first picture was uh, Lask Air Base in Poland. So when you think about what the, the, this deployment just did, it was a lot in the news, but it really truly was an example of how we can get places rapidly and do things. 
The other is directed energy weapons. Everybody thinks, you know, you have a tendency to talk about high power microwaves and lasers and it's kind of science fiction and, you know, you put little lightning bolts on the slide but nobody really understands what the lightning bolt actually does. Um, but that's, this is a reality. I will tell you that General Brad Heithold at AFSOC is really working hard to make this picture a fielded capability very soon. And I believe that we will have a directed energy capability in a pod that can be mounted on a fighter aircraft very soon as well. When you think about that, that'll change the game. Imagine your ability to defeat an enemy's surface-to-air capability with a directed energy weapon so you can penetrate an anti-access aerial denial environment. Or what Bill Eddard is doing as part of NORAD NORTHCOM, what happens if you developed a directed energy capability to defend your own airspace to keep adversary airplanes from entering? Directed energy weapons is an area we're headed towards and we're going there at a fairly good pace, and, and I actually think it's a lot closer uh, than a lot of people think it is. Global precision attack is about our ability to hold anything that an adversary holds dear at risk. And the way we do that is amazing. If you look at what our airmen, our air crew and our battlefield airmen are doing in the fight against ISIS today, it is simply amazing. You, you, it, it, the precision and the discipline with which they're escort, uh, executing those missions is a historic in what they're able to do. The lowest civilian, civilian casualty rates ever with the greatest precision we've ever seen. It's, it's simply amazing. And it's again, it's all about those capabilities, that technology, and then when you put it in the hands of airmen, what they're able to do with it. This picture was taken about a week ago. That uh, young lady there is uh, Lieutenant Caitlin Valle. She's a 13 Lima. She's a JTAC qualified TAC-P, and it's, she's simply amazing. She'd just gotten back from Operation Inherent Resolve the night before. And uh, she did, uh, you, if you talk to uh, the folks over there and what she was able to do downrange, she, she truly is an amazing airman. 100,000 pounds of weapons were dropped with her as a key player. She developed the battle space and the airspace plan for the whole area, and she just did phenomenal work. She's just a fantastic airman. She's also very humble. She really didn't want her picture in this briefing, as a matter of fact. She'll tell you, TACPs, it's all about the team. And she'll point to every one of those folks in the background that you see there, and she'll say, they're the reason we're successful, these incredible folks behind me. But I outrank her, so her picture is in the slide deck. <laughs> there you have it. But a fantastic airman. And what are we doing? We're doing everything in our power to make her job easier and to make those soldiers that we're taking care of on the ground safer. We're developing cockpit-selectable weapons. That's a new term that we use for things like the small diameter bomb, too. Uh, the one that the Secretary mentioned the other day, the Advanced Precision Kill Weapon System, all those capabilities where we can change the yield and we increase the magazine depth on the airplanes. Instead of putting one bomb per pylon, we'll put four to seven bombs per pylon. Uh, it's an amazing capability, and we're even going far that. AFRL is looking at some uh, ability to do a, a selectable fuse in flight so you can change the frag pattern as you get to a CAS environment so you know what to use uh, based on the environment you're, you're getting into. And the discussion has to be about that. We have got to talk about how to do CAS better. The discussion of what platform is going to replace the A-10 to do CAS is ludicrous. We have to talk about how we do it better. And we do it better with technology and putting that technology in the hands of our airmen to make us even better at what we do. That's what we've done for the 68 years of the history of the United States Air Force, and that's what we need to do now. And how do we get to those things? How do we get to dial a yield? How do we get to unlimited magazine depth? How do we fuse the sensor suite on the aircraft when he checks in with the JTAC so that you eliminate friendly fire in the future? There's ways to do that, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about global precision attack and how we make Lieutenant Valle that much better at her job. And the other thing about global precision attack, it is not just warheads on foreheads. If you look at our cyber capabilities and electronic warfare, it changes the game as well. A famous warrior philosopher once said, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. If we could use cyber capabilities to deny airplanes, adversary airplanes, the ability to take off, that would change the fight. If we could use electronic warfare to the point that every radar screen in the integrated air defense system has a thousand targets on it and they can't figure out what the actual targets are, that would change the game. Those are things we can do. It's amazing. We, and we have examples. We do it all the time, but we're not doing it as much as we need to. There's examples like the 707th Communication Squadron Red Team. 
discovered uh, adversary malware trying to enter their network. So they found it, detected it, never got in. They took it apart. They figured out the techniques that the adversaries were using to put it in there. They made their system stronger to prevent everything from penetrating or more things from penetrating their network in the future. And then they took all this knowledge and they handed it over to the rest of the government and made all the government networks harder, more difficult to uh, introduce malware to. It's a phenomenal success story. And this past summer, for the first time, we included cyber operations as part of Red Flag. We had Cyber Flag before, but we never actually included it. We talked multi-domain ops, that's another domain. We declared cyber the fifth domain back in 2005, and it took us 10 years to get it into, cyber, into Red Flag. That's way too long. We've got to move faster than that. We cannot stop thinking about cyber or not do what we as airmen do in every domain that we have a footprint in, including cyber, because it's hard, because we can't understand the authorities, or because we're afraid we're going to offend people. We just cannot do that. We have got to take advantage of this warfighting domain and, to, and, and do what we need to do in it. Our adversaries, if you look at Russia and China and Iran and North Korea and even ISIS, they have a huge presence in the cyber domain. We have got to root them out in that domain and win in that domain, just like we're rooting out ISIS in the physical domain. And cyber is part of that. Electronic is part, is part of that. And I will tell you, when it comes to realistic training, I mentioned red flag. This last red flag I was out, folks, this isn't your, this isn't your dad's red flag. Uh, the, the space play, the cyber play, um, the entire red flag, it, it's just the realist train. We're not there yet, but we're getting a lot closer in how we train and how we do things. And cyber is a huge part of that, and we can't stop thinking about it. And we can't not do it because it's difficult. The other part that we, you know, you always hear questions about is how flexible the, the inherent attributes of air power, speed, range, and flexibility, and what we do. And, and there's often a discussion, for one thing, about the 72-hour ATO cycle. Well, let's put that to rest. 72-hour ATO cycle is deliberate planning. It's no different than doing an O plan or a tip fit. But the execution of theater air power happens in seconds and minutes. And it's incredible what we do with our ability to move airplanes around, information around, what our C2 and ISR airmen are able to do to provide real-time change to missions. You, you, your mission can change up to step time uh, when you're getting ready to take off. And then as soon as you get airborne, you can react and change to the environment as required to do whatever you have to do. So uh, I'll tell one quick story, and it's the story of Major Dave Gostep Tula. Sorry, Zaytar. Um, and he was a weapons officer of the 95th, the Bones, uh, and he went over there with uh, Fangs Gilbert, the squadron commander of Bones, uh, in the early deployment in the fight against ISIS. So Ghost and his wingman took off at 6 o'clock at night. And the first mission they had was they escorted a coalition strike into Syria, and it was Bahrainis, it was uh, Emiratis, it was Jordanians and Saudis, and the F-22 escort. They did deliberate targeting, targeting in accordance with the ATO, and then because, again, the capability of the F-22, it did tactical reconnaissance to see the success of those strikes. Then they went out, picked up some F-16s, came back in with the F-16s and did time-sensitive dy dynamic retargeting of what Intel was developing in combatant positions and combatant uh, equipment. And they took those out. Then they went back to the tanker, spent three hours hanging out on the tanker, and then they picked up a a U.S. only package and went deep into Syria in the integrated air defense system, very heavily defended integrated air defense system with EF-18Gs, B-1s, and F-16s again, and took out key communications node and key uh, ISIS leadership. By the time Ghost and his wingman landed, they had done six different aerial mission sets and flown for almost 12 hours. That is flexibility, agility, speed range, of air power, and that's what we can do with the air power that we have today, with it in the hands of the incredible airmen we have. And it's not just, it's not just the aircraft. If you look at what our Intel, our DCGS, our Distributed Common Ground System, uh, and our RPA PA airmen do, their flexibility is as good, in many cases, even better than the, than the other airplanes. They cannot change just within an AOR, but they can change from CENTCOM to UCOM to PACOM in the matter of minutes. I mean, the amount of work they do is incredible and their ability from an RPA GCS and our distributed common ground system and its ability to do the analysis of that and aid those fights is simply incredible. 
There's a story of Tech Sergeant Luis Rodriguez. He was a central operator in MQ-9, supported by the DGS, and he was doing convoy overwatch. In the matter of a, a couple of seconds, the mission needed to change to a troops in contact. So the entire enterprise, the RPA GCS, uh, GCS the distributed, com the distributed gown station, and the analysts, they all changed to this. They went, they got over friendly forces. It was a danger close. Enemies about 100 meters north of them. JTAC through the, uh, the ground commander says, there they are, take them out. Two hellfires later, they devastated the enemy and saved the, the troops in contact. And then that night, Tech Sergeant Rodriguez went home and had dinner with his family. That's the way we do air power. That's fifth generation, and that's the new way that we as the Air Force have taken the technology we have through remote split ops and everything else we do and have made it that much better. And if you look at our ISR and C2 airmen, it, it, is, it is incredible what they do. And if you look at what we're asking of those folks in the DCGS, we're trying to get to DCGS next, and we're looking for industry's help. Uh, we're looking to get better at that. If they're drowning in data, if you look at the amount of information that those young men and women are dealing with every day, how they find anything in that is unbelievable. Their amount of information that's given to them is simply amazing. We have to help them figure out how to sift through that raw data and get better at it. We need to change data into knowledge to give us the decision advantage against our adversaries. Going back to John Boyd, going back to the way airmen think, we're better than any other Air Force in the world because we think inside of what the other potential adversaries think. We're better at it than they are. And we have to help these folks, and we have to get them that capability to get the information into decision advantage so that we can continue to press the fight. And the other thing we have to do, and as Lori, General Lori Robinson uh, uh, talked about yesterday, we're never going to fight alone again. We know that. Our adversaries, uh, our Pacific Air Chiefs are here. Uh, Frank Gorin faces the same thing in, in UCOM. We face the same thing in CENTCOM. So we have to figure out how to collaborate and talk and share information with our friends and partners. We have got to stop having systems and processes that can't share information across a coalition. This is illustrative of an example of a bunch of B-1 weapons officers who are planning a strike into Syria, and they needed their coalition because they were escorting coalition, and they ended up with a sheet of white paper on the floor of the CAOC drawing out the attack plans. We owe them better than that. We have got to get better than that. That's clearly it's not a B-1 and it's not the IUD chaos. That is General Robin Rand in the middle, by the way, in case anybody's wondering. So, <laughs> talking to his bomber guys. Um, but we have to get better at this. We know that we're going to do this with friends and partners. So how do we share that information? How do we make this collaborative so that we can do everything we need to do? Because we're going to fight with them. These are our great friends over here, the Pacific Air Chiefs. They're amazing. And we have to be on the same sheet of music, and we don't need our airmen to be doing plans on a piece of paper on the floor of the chaos. We owe them better than that. And any time I talk about ISR, I cannot talk about ISR without talking about command and control. I've been I, I think those two are inextricably linked. It's decision capability, and it's execution of theater air power at a command and control level at a theater level. I've been accused of being a C2 zealot. I'm proud to say I am. Uh, because I think it's that important. We do it better than anybody else in the world. The United States Air Force is the best at command and control of anybody in the world. But our adversaries know that. Just like General Ma in the PLA Air Force, they're going to attack it. We see it today. They are going after our ability to command and control. And command and control is two words. That's the other thing. We have a tendency to go command and control as if it's one thing. It's not. You can have great command organization, you can have a great commander's intent and an air operations directive, and you can do all that right, but if you can't control your theater air power forces in the fight near to real time, you don't have C2. And our concept, the tenet of air power is centralized command, decentralized execution. That has been around since then Colonel Billy Mitchell in the Battle of St. Mahel. We learned it again in the World War II in North Africa. We have to be able to do that, but we have to be able to control those forces. We have to be able to exercise that control that goes with the command and the command organizations. John Hyten's one of the smartest guys we have in our Air Force. He's brilliant. He'll tell you, you can fight SATCOM, 
It's, it's hard, but you can do it. You, you move things around, you can, you can fight SATCOM. But you need an architecture and an organization to be able to do that. You can't do it if each type of communications is stovepiped under a separate organization or a separate service, and they can't talk to each other, or somebody doesn't have centralized command of that SATCOM. How are we going to take advantage of the aerial layered network? How do we make every coalition aircraft and U.S. aircraft a communications node so you build an aerial layered network and you get the mesh network across the battle space? What's next? We've done Bacon has been incredible. We're developing Talon Hate and MAPS is coming after that. How do we create that network capability to fight off adversaries attacking our C2 nodes? And they will attack our C2 nodes. How do we get there from here? We're even doing things. We're looking at some great ideas. There's some great technology with things like wideband HF. And we're trying to move forward on that in a tech demo to prove that we can do that with fidelity that we need to do to control air power. So we're working on all these things, but we have to because we know every opponent that we could ever possibly face has watched what we do. They know if the United States owns everything more than eight feet off the ground, we will win. And they're going to attack that. And one of the ways they're going to attack that is C2. And last but definitely not least is our personnel recovery core function at Air Combat Command. This is the epitome of uh, low density, high demand assets. In many cases, for our coalition partners to participate in operations, they need to have U.S. personnel recovery, and they need to have it close, and they need to be able to rely on it. And what these folks do is amazing. We've got to get better at it. We have to keep the combat rescue helicopter on track. We have to keep that moving forward. We have to keep the HC-130J moving forward in that as well. We've got to find the technologies to be able to do PR in a contested environment. What does that look like? What is that package? They're developing some great capability in microsensors uh, at AFRL. AFRL is doing some other work. Uh, but th these are things that we have to keep moving forward on because, again, a moral obligation we have is to pick up our folks that are, that, are, that are down behind enemy lines. And these guys do it. They're simply amazing at what they do. Now, if anybody that knows my Scottish wife, Jillian, you will know that she made me put a slide in this speech with a guy in a kilt. So I had to do that. Um, she'll tell you it's a very practical garment, by the way, and, but she's Scottish, so she would think that. Um, but this is a story of that young man in the inset, and he's also the far left there on that, uh, on that picture of folks. That's uh, Tech Sergeant Cameron Heistad. And uh, a while back in Afghanistan, he's one of our PR professionals, and there were 12 British paratroopers that were caught in a minefield, seven of them severely injured. He went in, cabled down, and took all 12 of those folks out one at a time. That picture is taken with those folks because of what Tech Sergeant Heistad did to save their lives. We owe him the most equipment, the best equipment, the best capability, and the best training we can give him. Because we all know what our airmen will do. Absolutely anything. They're simply amazing. But we owe it to him to give him the equipment to do it, and we owe him to give him the latitude to use their minds the way they think to be the best they can be. And there's an example of it right there with Tech Sergeant Heistad. So before I get off the stage, or before I take some questions, I just got a couple other things I want to talk about. And I think um, we'll have a chance maybe to talk about this in the future. Um, we are on the ragged edge. Our ops tempo is unrelenting. If you look at what's going on in the world today, it's incredible. And the demand for theater air power across the globe is simply unmatched. If you think about it, there was a time when the Air Force was accused of next war-itis. Yet, we look at what's happening today, and you look at the PRC in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, you look at little green men and Russian hybrid warfare, you look at North Korea, you look at what Iran potentially could do in the future, and guess what? We needed to think about that. At the same time, we thought, hey, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, we're out of Iraq, we'll be out of Afghanistan a year ago. So everything's good, right? And then failed states like Yemen and Libya. You look at ISIS and the advance of ISIS, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, pick it. Nothing's going away. And with the capacity we have today, we're, our, our ops tempo is simply unrelenting. And we've got to figure this out. Part of it is our big, big eye innovation from our airmen. Part of it is the technology. 
Part of it is we simply don't have the capacity to do everything that the combatant commanders ask us to do. And we have the best and brightest airmen in the world. You all know that. We see them every day. We got to give them awards yesterday morning up here. We got to see 12 incredible airmen yesterday. I'm, I'm, I am really glad I don't have to compete against any one of those 12. I'd lose. They're amazing. I mean, they're simply amazing what our airmen are like. But whether we're willing to admit it or not, we're burning them out. We are losing incredible airmen that love what they do because we're burning them out and we're asking too much of their families. And we've got to figure out how to get through this. And we've got to figure out the capacity discussion and we've got to figure out how to take care of our airmen and their families. So this is my bottom line in this whole thing is we need, we need, and I know the United States does it, we always have and we always will, we produce the greatest technology in the world. We need that cutting edge technology. And if we take that, and if we as a nation are committed to that, the aerospace nation that AFA talks about, we're committed to those technologies and we hand it over to our incredible airmen, we will continue to be the greatest air force on the planet. Every one of us, our air force leadership, have to, we have a moral objective to make sure that every airman, whether he's deployed downrange or he's doing his mission from home station or in garrison, is trained, ready, capable, and equipped to do the mission that we are asking them to do. We owe it to those airmen, we owe it to their families, and we owe it to our nation. Folks, uh, it's been a great opportunity to talk to you today. I appreciate it. Um, uh, and I'm more than, I think I got a, a little bit of time, so I'm more than welcome to answer any questions if there's any out there. Thank you very much. Well, since we're talking fifth generation, stealth is kind of the centerpiece of all of that. And since we've had such an advantage over our potential adversaries in stealth for a while now, but there's a lot of efforts out there to do anti-stealth defenses. Can you talk about that and the role stealth will play, continue to play in the future, and uh, whether or not if it will require other things like anti-jam, electronic warfare support in order to keep that edge? Well, I can. So first of all, uh, you know, I, I think um, anybody that thinks stealth is obsolete is simply naive. I, I mean, if you look at the amount of systems out there, the amount of, of uh, national resources our potential adversary nations have thrown in to everything they do, whether it's weapon systems or radars or missiles or surface air missiles, uh, th there, it's out there in, in, a, in a huge uh, preponderance of capability. Stealth is going to be around and it's important for a long time to come. But we can't, again, rest on that. I guess that was my point in the discussion is if you look at what our adversaries are doing with trying to get to anti-stealth technologies, they're out there and they're trying to do it. Or if you look at what our adversaries are doing in developing their own stealth, stealth capability, like I said, the PAC-FA or the J-20, an electronic warfare realm. So we have to keep pushing it. So I think stealth is clearly, it's part of our repertoire, it's part of our arsenal, but we have to go beyond that. So the beyond that is electronic warfare. Uh, what happens if we can figure out a way that we can go across the spectrum from, say, 20 megahertz to 40 gigahertz with electronic warfare, something that nobody else can do? How about if we can figure out a way that when a radar hits something, we suck up all that energy so there's no reflection? That changes the idea of stealth pretty significantly. How do you work across the, the spectrum so you're looking multispectral stealth? What is the next generation airplane going to look at. I, I, you know, obviously I'm it's well above my pay grade, but I think there's going to be another, uh, another aircraft in the future post F-22, F-35. What does that sixth generation airplane look like? How does it do multispectral stealth? So we're working on it. We're working on the electronic warfare realm. We're working on it improving stealth and doing multispectral stealth. Uh, and we're working on it with how we employ and the techniques, techniques and procedures. But again, I would say that uh, again, anybody that says stealth is obsolete, that, that's a naive approach. There's so much more to it than that, and it's so much part of uh, what we're able to do in how we conduct the fight today. So, Okay, thank you. Uh, would you, uh, let me back up a little bit. You know, we had the F-15, F-16 mix in the past. We envisioned an F-22, F-35 mix where the F-22 would be the, the big daddy on uh, air supremacy. 
But now with that, uh, by having been truncated in, the, in a, a fairly small fleet, we're going to be relying on the F-35 for air superiority as, all, uh, as well. Would you talk about its capabilities in that arena? So um, I, I think uh, this is not a, um, a newsflash for anybody. We don't have enough F-22s. That's a fact of life. We, we didn't buy enough. We don't have enough. Uh, if you look at the way we're using them today in the current fight we're in, when you look at um, what we would do in a future fight, we flat don't have enough F-22s. That's a fact. But we have what we have, and they're doing incredible work, and what the airmen flying those things are doing is, is phenomenal. So the F-35 is, a, is, and again, it's in a developmental stage. It's still got some challenges, but I truly believe it's ahead of the F-22 at the same stage in its development, and I think the F-35 is going to be a fantastic airplane. It is not a super cruise and it's not a maneuverability airplane. That's not what it was designed for. It's a multi-role airplane that has an incredibly comprehensive, powerful, integrated avionics and sensor suite. It has incredible electronic warfare in both the ECM and ECCM capability. So I think in the future, one of the, I do believe that there's going to be still that high-low mix. You're going to need the Raptors to be able to do some of those things against a high-end fight to take some things down. Uh, to allow the rest of the force, which will include leading edge F-35s, uh, to penetrate denied airspace. So you're still going to have to do that, and we're going to do it with the 180 or so F-22s we have. But the F-35, um, you know, I, I know there was a lot of press about the F-16 versus F-35. That, you know, that, that's not what the airplane was designed to do. Um, it was, uh, you know, I mean, if... if it's, it's designed to do that uh, incredible multi-role capability with its, the sensor suite and the integration and the SA it provides the pilot. It's the electronic warfare piece of that. It's all those things that make it the airplane that it is. They're going to be used in a role, and F-35 against any fourth-generation airplane, probably other than a close-in maneuvering fight, is going to do exceedingly well. Its capability to detect adversaries when they don't even know it's there, its weapons capability and how it's loaded out, depending on what that looks like, it's going to be a great airplane and do great work. But it's going to be a combination of F-22s and F-35s in the future. And this will have to be the final question. Uh, you started off by saying we need to change how we think, but technology was still the majority of your speech. So what do you mean, or can you elaborate on how we should be thinking? Well, I, I, maybe I misspoke a little bit. What I mean is we need to take advantage of the way our airmen think. I, I truly believe our Air Force, uh, as I said, we're, born, we're a service born out of technology. Uh, the generation, those 12 outstanding airmen you see, the young men and women we see around the stage today, they think differently than I do. I mean, I, I was telling somebody the other day, I, you know, I, I was a captain in the Cold War, um, I was a major during Desert Storm. I was a squadron commander in OG during Northern Watch and Southern Watch, and I was a wing commander at Eglin and Elmendorf during Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. That's a different world than what the kids are growing up today in. They think differently. They have an ability to do things that we don't think of. We have to unleash that thought. Um, again, if you look at some of those things that our airmen are doing with the technology we give them, uh, they are making it so much better. Look at what they do with the DCGS and the RPAs. Look at what our C2 Enterprise does with what they have. It's phenomenal. So my, my push was we need to unleash the brain power of these incredible young airmen, give them the technology, unleash their brain power, and then make sure we take care of them and their families so they stay with us. Thank you. And uh, once again, you can see by the size of the crowd here that this is a popular topic, and we appreciate you coming and speaking to us about this. Uh, you mentioned that you're a historian, so we'd like to provide you this little bio on Kurt LeMay. Excellent. And thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it.